In 2009, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the wisest and most spiritually mature leader on the planet, astounded his audience at a conference in Vancouver by saying that the world would be saved by Western women. The great question now is, what can women do in this dark and dangerous time? Perhaps we should listen to what the Dalai Lama is saying. The Dalai, Dalai Lama calls for a new awakening in this book. In another context, he said this about war. War and the large military establishments are the greatest sources of violence in the world. Whether their purpose is defensive or offensive, these vast, powerful organizations exist solely to kill human beings. We should think carefully about the reality of war. War is monstrous. Its very nature is one of tragedy and suffering. On March 25th, together with other organizations and individuals, he sent out this message to the world. The time to ban and eliminate nuclear weapons is now. It is either the end of nuclear weapons or the end of us. So that's one thing women can do. They can work for the end of nuclear weapons in whatever way they can. Now this nuclear weapon that was paraded in 2018, I think in Moscow at a victory parade is capable of destroying an entire country the size of Ukraine, which is roughly the size of France. France has a population of 67 million and Ukraine of 41 million, nearly all of whom would die in the case of a nuclear strike with this weapon. Look at the name of this demonic weapon, Satan II. How have we come to descend into this pit of depravity to believe that under any circumstances, whatever, it is morally acceptable to bring these weapons into being, to actually create them? The Dalai Lama says, war is like a fire in the human community, one whose fuel is living beings. We talk about this or that marvelous weapon as a remarkable piece of technology without remembering that if it is actually used, it will burn living people alive. And he continues, no soldier wants to be wounded or die. None of his loved ones wants to, any harm to come to him. If one soldier is killed or maimed for life, at least five or 10 people, his relatives and friends will also suffer. We should all be horrified by the extent of this tragedy. Turning to the war in Ukraine, an estimated 15,000 Russian soldiers, many of them young conscripts, and seven of their generals or commanders have so far been killed in the space of four weeks. Thousands more have been wounded. Many of these young soldiers are confused, angry, and terrified. The Ukrainian losses are far less, and we have just seen the atrocities that the Russian soldiers have committed in today's papers. People are suffering terribly. So what can women do? Well, women can speak up as I am doing for the highest moral values which so serve and protect life. These values are ancient and universal. They override loyalty to a nation or a government. Certain governments have betrayed these values by spending enormous sums in the last 75 years on accumulating nuclear and other weapons. They have done it in the interests of defense and in order to gain greater power over other nations. Mothers worldwide could come together demanding that all nations renounce their nuclear weapons. Mothers of, in nations now engaged in war could say that they refuse to sacrifice their sons anymore. The war in Chechnya a few years ago was stopped by Russian mothers and the war in Ukraine could be stopped by them again. Woman's voice has been ignored for thousands of years and it is time the leaders of nations heard it. Victory parades prepare people for the sacrifice of thousands of young men whose lives will be prematurely extinguished for the sake of their nation. This extraordinary time we are living in is giving us an opportunity to recover these forgotten values which serve and protect life to birth a new world. It's as if two tectonic plates are grinding together, 
The old patriarchal order that promoted war is dying and the new one that renounces the horror of war is struggling to be born. Change is coming and it is inevitable if we are to survive as a species. All of you who are listening to this talk have a vital role to play in birthing this new world. But you need to understand the long historical process that has led us to this crucial time of awakening and choice, which is also a time of judgment on the whole of humanity. In this talk, therefore, I will take you back many thousands of years so that you can understand the radical change of consciousness that is needed now in order to birth a peaceful world. So you do not get taken over by the archetypal powers that are activated in a time of fear and conflict. What we are watching in Russia's invasion of Ukraine are the death throes of the old patriarchal order. This pattern cannot continue if we wish to survive as a species. So to begin with, we will look at the Paleolithic and Neolithic eras some 25,000 years ago, when the cosmos was imagined as a mother from whose womb all forms of life emerged in a continuous process of birth, death, and regeneration. For tens of thousands of years, the ground from which life arose and to which it arose and which, to which it returned was maternal. What we now call cosmos and nature was a living web of relationships ensouled by the great mother. And you can see three images here. Certainly the two on the right are of the great mother. Possibly the one on the left is an actual woman who was going to give birth shortly and whose hand on her womb is related to the crescent, the crescent moon that she's holding in her hand. So there was a relationship between what is growing in her womb and what is growing in the heavens. It's the most marvelous image. So the Milky Way was the starry passage by which souls entered and left this world. And the shamanic journey into non-ordinary states of consciousness was the spiritual experience throughout this long era. This was a cosmology of profound connection and relationship and of kinship with all creation. The most important idea about this time is that there was no creator beyond creation. No separation therefore between the great mother as source or womb and the myriad forms of her life. The great mother was both the starry cosmos and all life on earth. All forms of life were her children and everything was infused with divinity because each and all were part of her sacred cosmic order. Woman was revered because like nature, the great mother, she was the carrier of new life. Now the cosmology of what I've called the lunar era, because the moon was so important, was focused on a cyclical process of birth, death and regeneration that arose from the age old observation of the phases of the moon, its birth as a crescent, its waxing to fullness and its waning into the three days of darkness. Out of that darkness, the crescent was continually reborn. Light and darkness, life and death were not polarized as they were to become in the subsequent era, but were two phases of a total cycle, always leading to regeneration and a new cycle. Through an expanded consciousness assisted by shamanic practices and hallucinatory plants, people in the lunar era saw their lives as part of the great cosmic cycle of birth, death and renewal and knew that although the body died, their soul would take another form in a new life. This may have been the distant origin of belief in reincarnation. They saw the whole of nature as alive with spirit, and they knew how to communicate with water, trees and stones, as well as animals, plants and birds, and how to keep in touch with the ancestors. In other words, they had an enhanced participatory consciousness that we have lost. I wonder if we couldn't teach our children how to reconnect with nature in the way that they were connected thousands of years ago. Now we can follow the image of the great mother into the Neolithic era 8,000 8, years ago, as I'm showing you on this map, 
there was an extraordinary very early civilization which, which developed along the banks of the great rivers of Eastern Europe and the shores of the Black Sea. This included Romania and Bulgaria, Moldova and Ukraine, which you can't see here, which is above, you can see the Crimea on the right, and above that is Ukraine. But included Southern Italy, Malta, Greece, and Crete, as well as the countries that I've already mentioned. So this was an immensely important civilization that nobody knows anything about. It was matrilineal, it was agricultural and peaceful. People lived in harmony with nature and they worshiped the great mother. For 3000 years, that's two, a thousand years longer than our own era, until 3500 BC, there is no evidence of conflict and territorial aggression or defensive hill fortifications. There are no burials of men with weapons. There is no evidence of hierarchy. It was a highly creative and artistic civilization that left a strong cultural legacy in Southeastern Europe that we can still see traces of today, particularly in Crete and Malta. The Lithuanian archeologist, Marija Gimbutas, was the first person to reveal the marvels of this hitherto unknown civilization. She wrote two wonderful books about it called The Civilization of the Goddess and The Language of the Goddess. I urge you to read them. But archeologists dismissed her findings and for decades they ignored them until finally in uh, 2018, she was vindicated in a lecture given by one of the leading archeologists in Chicago. But by then I'm afraid she had died exhausted by the struggle with these rejecting archeologists. So here is a wonderful image of the great mother dating to 5000 BC and found in Romania. A shamanic pathway symbolized by the labyrinth connected the two aspects of her being, her earthly and her cosmic aspect. At death, people took this pathway to return to her womb, to be reborn in a new cycle of life. Here are some magnificent examples of the kind of pottery made by these people. A few years ago, I saw them at an exhibition called The Civilization of Old Europe in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. And I was absolutely stunned by their beauty and also by their huge size. Some of them two and a half feet wide, like the one in the middle there with a beautiful spiral on it. There must be similar ones in a museum in Kiev because I have just learned that like Marie Higgumbutas, there was a Russian-Ukrainian archeologist called Vikenty Kovoyka in the early part of the last century, who discovered thousands of tiny images of women or goddesses in Ukraine, as well as large well-made temples and houses. His discoveries didn't fit with the mindset of the Soviet Union. And so like the discoveries of Gimbutas, they were ignored for decades. These people he found were agriculturalists, extraordinary potters, blacksmiths, goldsmiths and coppersmiths, weavers. He found the largest amount of worked gold ever found anywhere. And everywhere he found images of throned women like this one from Romania and images of men with exquisite expressions, carvings of stone so beautifully made that one could see the tenderness of the hands that held the baby. Every object used in every aspect of life was lovingly ornamented with symbols of nature, with the sun and the moon, the stars, rain, with snakes and birds and bulls, and with trees or branches or seeds, with flowers and water, and with magical symbols of circles and crosses and endless meanders. Now this peaceful agricultural civilization which included Ukraine, was brought to an end by three successive incursions of patriarchal tribes called Kurgans or Proto-Europeans from 3,500 BC to 1500 BC. And these came down from the Russian steppes, just like they are doing now, 
bringing with them the horse, lethal weapons, and the war chariot. They spread south and west into Europe and east towards India, which they reached about 2500 BC. And Europe, including Ukraine, was never the same again. All evidence of this civilization had vanished until Marie Higimputas and Vikenti Kovoika discovered it. So now we move on to the Bronze Age and to the image of the Neolithic goddess as she becomes the great goddesses of that Bronze Age. Goddesses such as Isis in Egypt, Inanna in Suma, and Artemis of Ephesus, all of whom were worshipped as the queen of heaven and associated with the moon. For many thousands of years, the great mother and these great goddesses personified the principle of relationship, the interconnectedness of every aspect of life, and above all, the sacredness of the great web of life that we call nature. This is what they stood for, the sacredness of nature. The primary question of the lunar era was, how should the human community act so as to be in harmony with the life of the cosmos? This is the question that we've forgotten and we should be asking ourselves now. Plato in his Timaeus was the first to give a name to an all embracing cosmic entity, which he described as a single living creature that encompasses all the living creatures that are within it. He called it the soul of the cosmos. The priceless legacy of this whole era was the shamanic understanding that the cosmos has an inner life, a soul, and that humans could communicate with it and derive their laws from listening to its voice. So we carry within our psyche a very ancient kind of consciousness or experience of life that I call lunar consciousness and associate with the timeless wisdom of the soul. It is an instinctive, feminine, participatory, relational way of knowing, mediated through the heart, enhanced sensory observation and intu intuition that opens the path between two dimensions of reality. We need to reconnect with this lost consciousness and learn to listen again to what Jung called the spirit of the depths or the voice of the soul. Now, moving on to the subsequent solar era, which has lasted over 4,000 years from circa 2000 BC until the present day, we find a cosmology that is radically different from the lunar era. It is a cosmology of separation, characterized by dissociation, duality, fragmentation and polarization, which resulted directly from the separation of nature from spirit and the continual conflict between cities and nation states right up to our present time. During the course of it, we lost the feminine participatory consciousness that we had in the lunar era and the sense that we lived within a sacred order an insight that has only survived to our time in the indigenous cultures of the world. The focus of this whole era is on the establishment of the patriarchal order led by male warrior leaders, together with male priesthoods that exist to this day. But it is also about a violent and traumatic separation from the deeper matrix of the soul or psyche and a severance of our relationship with nature, cosmos, and Earth. The rapid growth of the population contributed to the drive for territorial conquest that was led by warrior kings presiding over immense empires, of which there were at least seven, that were built on the slavery of conquered peoples. With this rise of nations and empires came the idea of power over others, and how a certain territory belonged to a specific group. Fighting for more territory involved killing or enslaving others. And this new male quest for territory, power, and the renown of the conqueror destroyed the old lunar relationship with a harmonious cosmic order. The brutal invasion of Ukraine by Putin, 
or the invasion of Iraq by the US and the UK, arrogantly named Operation Shock and Awe, are a reenactment of the pattern of conquest that has extended through four millennia. To the psychopathic military leader in the grip of an archetypal inflation, the death and suffering of others means nothing in relation to the power and territory acquired through conquest and regime change. During the solar era, the sun replaced the moon as the primary celestial body. Between the lunar and the solar eras, there was a time in Egypt, Sumer, Greece, and Rome when goddesses and gods peopled the heavens and as in the Iliad and the Odyssey interacted with humans. Ultimately, however, in the three patriarchal religions, the great father replaced the great mother as the sole image of deity. And with the loss of the goddess, Western civilization developed on the foundation of a fundamental dissociation between spirit and nature and creator and creation. This dissociation destroyed the ancient sacredness of nature and the shamanic ability to connect with the soul of the cosmos. It also destroyed our ability to recognize the presence of spirit within the material world, opening the way to its exploitation. It was during this era that we lost touch permanently with the voice of the soul. Now two immensely powerful and polarizing cosmologies became the major influence on the social, political and religious history of Western civilization. The first of these was the battle between light and darkness, good and evil, order and chaos, symbolized by the hero's fight with the dragon that was endlessly repeated in paintings and sculptures. This cosmology projected into the world led to endless struggles for power between groups and later between nations. Ultimately, it would lead to the battle to conquer and subjugate nature in the service of man, nature being associated with a dragon. In the patriarchal religions, the feminine archetype associated with the goddess was split off from transcendent spirit. Nature and the earth were therefore no longer sacred. Man became identified with spirit, light and order, and woman with nature, darkness and chaos. 4,000 years ago, man assumed a position of dominance over nature and woman, and woman's voice was silenced. A former ancient world as priestess and healer was forbidden, and her sole value consisted in her being the carrier of man's seed. This archaic belief still prevails among the Taliban in Afghanistan, who have just forbidden girls over 12 to attend school. The key theme of the solar era is ascent to the light and repudiation of the darkness that became associated with nature. The development of, of, the, development of the conscious mind in humanity as a whole, together with its stupendous cultural and scientific achievements, can be recognized as the evolutionary achievement of the solar era, the evolutionary achievement of man, if you like. But this achievement was built on the widening chasm between transcendent spirit and nature or matter. This whole process was closely tied into the invention of writing and the power that literacy gave to an elite group of very powerful rulers and priesthoods who deliberately destroyed the older lunar order with its shamanic practices and rituals. Our relationship with nature was severed as the image of deity changed from great mother to great father. In splitting nature from spirit and banishing the divine feminine from the image of God, the patriarchal religions cut God in half or lost half of God, if you like. None of them taught their followers that we are part of the earth's life and that the earth is part of a sacred cosmic order. Their beliefs have led to the gradual desouling of the world and the crisis we face now. The painting, by the way, is by Cecil Collins, if any of you are interested. Now the loss of the great mother and the great goddess came in stages in different areas 
but a second polarizing cosmology accelerated their demise. And this was the myth of the fall of man described in Genesis 2 and 3. An enormous change in Hebrew cosmology took place in 621 BC, when a group of priests called Deuteronomists took control of the first temple in Jerusalem that you can see here in a reconstruction. Prior to this, the Jewish people had worshiped both a goddess and a god, a queen and a king of heaven, who together had created the world. The queen of heaven, whose name was Asherah, was worshiped as the Holy Spirit and divine wisdom, and also as the tree of life, a cosmic tree connecting the invisible and visible worlds whose fruit was the gift of immortality. The Deuteronomists eradicated all trace of the goddess, removing from the temple her statue and that of the great bronze serpent that symbolized her power to regenerate life. They also cut down her sacred groves of trees and smashed all clay images of her. Then they very cleverly created the myth of the fall, downgrading the goddess into the human figure of Eve and bestowing on Eve the former title of the goddess, mother of all living. It was in this way that the Jewish people lost the image of their goddess, leaving Yahweh as the sole creator God. The only place where the teachings and rituals of the first temple may have survived was in the later mystical teaching of Kabbalah, known as the voice of the dove and the jewels of the heavenly bride. Now, unfortunately, Christianity adopted this monotheistic image of God from Judaism, as well as the myth of the fall in Genesis 2 and 3. They didn't pay any attention to Genesis 1, which had quite a different interpretation. Fast forward to AD 325, when the Council of Nicaea, um, or a, a gathering of a number of bishops from all over the Mediterranean area, created the Christian myth of Jesus as the celibate, immaculately conceived, only son of God, whose sacrificial death had ensured our salvation and redemption from sin. I should say that there was a huge battle that took place between two groups of bishops. One who said that uh, Jesus was of the same substance of God, and the other who said that he was like unto God, and the difference hung on a single letter in one word, which I can't go into now because of the time it would take. But as I say, there was a huge battle before it came out that um, Jesus was <clears throat> of the same substance as God. And at the same council, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, was also defined as male. So there was no longer a feminine element in the Godhead. Previously, in both the Hebrew and the Greek world, the Holy Spirit had been feminine. In this new patriarchal, cos new patriarchal cosmology, the sole image of deity is the transcendent great father. Divine imminence is lost. Earth is designated a place of exile and punishment for primordial sin. It is no longer sacred. Adam is given dominion over the animals, but he's no longer part of the divine order. He and Eve are banished to a world contaminated by the fall and subject to sin, suffering, and death, introduced into the world by Eve. Because she took that wretched apple from the tree. So since Eve was the primary agent of the fall, she took the blame for our banishment from the Garden of Eden. This led to the unrelenting persecution of women who had the heavy burden of the sin of Eve placed on them by the Christian fathers and generations of Christian priests, culminating in their being tried and condemned to death at the stake by the Inquisition over some five centuries, I may say. This immensely powerful myth is the main root of the misogyny that pollutes our culture to this day, giving rise to a deep unconscious suspicion, even a fear and a contempt for women and a consequent desire to control and silence them. Although great progress has been made over the last hundred years, women are still struggling 
to gain acceptance against really what is an unconscious, a deeply unconscious prejudice. Even though UN Resolution 1325, passed in the year 2000, stated that women should be included in all negotiations for peace, there is no sign of this happening in the current conflict or any other recent conflict. It is as if women count for nothing in the power struggles between men. Now, from the perspective of our relationship with the earth, this myth and the loss of the goddess and the divine feminine was a disaster, a real catastrophe, actually, even more than a disaster. Everything that was once associated with the divine feminine, that is to say nature, matter, sexuality, and the whole instinctual aspect of life was excluded from the divine or split off from it. Once again, nature, cut off from spirit, was effectively desold. We lost the awareness that spirit was active and present in the world, and we lost the sense of living within a sacred order. This myth imprinted us with a negative image of our presence on this planet, and also placed a heavy burden of shame and guilt, particularly sexual guilt, on our shoulders. The monotheistic cosmology of the three patriarchal religions has led to the situation where the earth is no longer recognized as sacred, and we are confronted with the catastrophic effects of the loss of the divine feminine. From the time of the Crusades, the Christian church in Rome pursued endless wars, conquests, and brutal conversions in the name of its God. We have recently acknowledged the evils of slavery, but it was a series of papal bulls from 1493 that gave the European nations permission to invade, capture, subdue, and enslave the indigenous populations and to seize all their lands and possessions. And we're still suffering from the effect of these papal bulls. Because of this lamentable history of conquest and subjugation, Western civilization has been on the wrong path for more than 2000 years, completely out of alignment with the earth and the cosmos. Now I want to show you what's happened really, because this diagram illustrates how our conscious mind, that tiny yellow triangle at the top of our total psyche, has become detached or cut off from the deeper matrix of the primordial soul out of which it has evolved. And it's become more and more inflated because it's all it knows of itself. It doesn't know anything about the deeper aspect um, from which it has emerged. So it has no relationship with nature or the cosmos, which the deeper aspect of itself is connected with. C.G. Jung, the psychiatrist, realized that as this conscious mind gained more and more autonomy in relation to the deeper aspect of the psyche, which had been cut off, the whole superstructure of consciousness became disengaged from the age-old matrix out of which it has emerged. Consciousness, consciousness thus torn from its roots, he said, possesses a Promethean freedom, but it also partakes of a godless hubris. This is the primary trauma that we all carry, completely unknown to us, that began with the rise of powerful empires and priesthoods and the loss of the shamanic ability to journey into the inner life of the cosmos through altered states of consciousness and receive instruction from that other dimension. The Czech psychiatrist Stanislav Grof has shown through his method of holotropic breathwork that memories of trauma inflicted millennia ago are still held in the collective psyche of our species. And here I want to show you what happens when the psyche is possessed by the will to power of the shadow, the unrecognized aspect of our nature. It can easily be taken over, the conscious mind can easily be taken over by what Jung called the shadow and the archetypal powers that exist in this unknown aspect of our nature. It's possible to view what's happened to Putin in this light because he has been taken over by his collective, uh, his unknown shadow really of his own nature. He's become inflated with an archetypal 
sense of his mission to restore uh, the Soviet Union as it was. And he sees it as a, as a God-given commission actually to him to do this. And this is extremely dangerous. And, and this is why he's behaved as he has, because he thinks he's really um, invited or commissioned by God to accomplish this mission. But it's also possible to view much that is happening in the world today as a collective psychosis, similar to what's happened with Putin. A takeover by the archetype of power, control and domination, created over millennia by our separation from our deeper matrix of the soul. One example of this psychosis was America's decision in 1945 to split the atom and develop the atomic and then the hydrogen bomb. And from this came the nuclear race and the Cold War with the Soviet Union. From this also came the nuclear weapons developed by the other seven nuclear powers, with Iran planning to become the 10th nation to develop this demonic weapon. There are, nuclear, there are nuclear weapons on high alert, now positioned all over the territory of Europe that's controlled by NATO. And the UK deploys about 160 nuclear warheads 40 on each of their four nuclear submarines, which are ready to be fired at any time. This to me is an example of the depravity that we've fallen into. Since 1945, there have been 2,624 nuclear explosions. And these, in addition to the Chernobyl and Fukushima catastrophes, have contributed to the huge increase in cancers worldwide. So Jung, watching all this some 40 years ago, said, God's powers have passed into our hands. The powers themselves are not evil, but in the hands of man, they are an appalling danger in evil hands. The splitting of the atom in 1945 was acclaimed as a great scientific advance, but it was also from the archetypal point of view, a rape of nature and matter. The subsequent bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, obliterating, obliterating the lives of millions of civilians, was an unforgivable crime against a helpless civilian population. And we have seen that crime repeated over and over again since that time. It was at this point that in Albert Schweitzer's words, we lost our humanity. My mother was warned in channel messages at this time that the splitting of the atom would lead to the splitting of the human psyche and to mass insanity. And I believe that insanity is reflected today in the ruthless struggle for power between the three great powers in the world, America, Russia, and China, each of which is still locked into the old paradigm of dominance and control. This is a lithograph by Picasso of a series he did on the Minotaur. And the Minotaur is a timeless image of what can happen to any one of us when the conscious mind is taken over by the will to power of the unconscious aspect of our nature. Technically, this is called an archetypal inflation. We regress into predatory behavior, thinking that we have every right to do what we're doing. When this happens, we will not hesitate to sacrifice whatever and whoever stands in our way in order to achieve our goal. This is what has happened to Putin. And this applies also to any of the so-called great powers of the world. And it also applies to any one of us who is determined to impose our will or the will of our group onto others. We can see it all around us at the present time in our society. When this happens, as this image illustrates, the feminine value is sacrificed and we lose the priceless evolutionary achievement of kinship with all creation and relationship with others. What is missing in these polarizing situations of archetypal possession is the feminine principle, whose highest expression is the image of the grail and I should say that the grail in the 12th century was the symbol of the feminine aspect of the Holy Spirit that had been denied expression because of that council at Nicaea in 325. 
it's a good thing to remember that this is what the grail represents, the Holy Spirit in feminine form. So calling on this image of the feminine can help to disengage us from the state of possession. And this, I think, is also where the mothers speaking up about their anguish at their sons being sacrificed in the hell of war can also have a profound effect on changing the polarized situation. Over recent centuries, we've reached dazzling heights of like scientific and medical and technological advances, which have transformed the physical conditions of our lives on this planet and facilitated a phenomenal expansion of our ability to express the creative genius of our species in many different areas, and also to communicate with each other as I'm doing now with you. But we've also suffered a catastrophic loss of soul, a loss of the ancient awareness of the sacred interweaving of all aspects of life, a loss of the sense of participation in the life of nature and the life of the cosmos, and despite all our religions, a radical misunderstanding of the nature of God. The whole foundation of our lives is missing because we've become disconnected from the cosmos. This is a beautiful drawing by my husband to really illustrate the being that is the nature of the cosmos. Now, this long process of the loss of relationship with nature and the cosmos, which has been for the most part unconscious, has led ultimately to the materialist or reductionist science that came into being over the last three centuries and controls our secular culture today. It has brought us enormous benefits through its many incredible discoveries, but it has also banished the concept of God and the soul together with whatever it has defined as non-rational. It regards the body as a machine and the cosmos as a machine or the universe as a machine made up of separate parts rather than a miraculous integrated organism. And it insists that consciousness originates in the neurons of the physical brain. So when the brain dies, consciousness ceases to exist. It has concluded that we are the only sentient beings in an inanimate universe that is without life or meaning, or purpose, or intelligence. We are basically biophysical machines with no free will. This bleak cosmology that's been taught in our schools and universities for over a hundred years has taken on the power and absolutism of an ideology, and it has been extremely difficult for scientists to challenge it because they would lose their academic positions and often their um, employment if they spoke up for anything different. No image describes this ideology better than in this painting of the Cyclops or one-eyed giant painted a hundred years ago by Odilon Redon, who must have seen what was happening then and was concerned about it enough to paint this extraordinary painting. In our, I've gone a bit ahead of myself, but it doesn't matter. In our secular culture, the rational human mind has virtually replaced God and no longer recognizes a dimension of reality beyond the material universe, <clears throat> nor any form of consciousness transcendent to its own. This materialist view of reality presented as incontrovertible con truth presents one huge problem. We are the only sentient beings in a lifeless universe. I'm going to go back to that um, painting of Yodelon Rodon. As observers, we are separate, just as this picture indicates, from the life of nature and the life of the universe. These beliefs offer no foundation for morality, which is increasingly vanishing from our world and no foundation for a relationship with the earth and with the cosmos. Is it surprising that so many people are showing symptoms of mental illness, even children are committing suicide because they feel their lives have no meaning and no value with this philosophy that's being taught. If it's called a philosophy, as I said, it's an ideology. Scientific material, 
scientific materialism has led to the belief that we can control and dominate the life of the planet to the sole advantage of our species, even to the splitting of the atom and the creation of our weapons of mass destruction. It has also led to something called the Great Reset or the Fourth Industrial Revolution, the name of a project devised in 1971 by a small group of very powerful and wealthy individuals. The name of their organization is the World Economic Forum, or WEF, headed by a man called Klaus Schwab. And their aim is to gain control of the whole planet through AI technology and digital dictatorship. All power, money, and property will be controlled by a world government with no elected officials. This project, which has already gained a foothold in a number of governments and attracted the support of their leaders, is a perfect example of an archetypal inflation or possession by the Minotaur. It is very powerful and very dangerous. So now I can come to the two hemispheres of the brain. Because according to the psychiatrist, Dr. Ian McGilchrist, who has many brilliant talks on, YouTube's, which are, on YouTube, which I advise you to listen to, we've become prisoners of the literal left hemispheric mind, which over centuries and millennia has closed down access to the imaginative right hemisphere and has led to this disastrous misinterpretation of reality. The left hemisphere is really the bureaucratic mind. It likes to have control. It likes to know what the next step is. It likes to move to the next step without allowing time to open to the imagination and think whether there could be another way of doing things altogether. It creates a kind of Gordian knot, which is almost impossible to dissolve or untie, if you like. And our whole society is tied up in these Gordian knots because of the left hemispheric control and the lack of the imagination, which has no way of getting in, so to speak. Anyway, that's what's happened. And he says we're in an extremely dangerous situation because we're being governed by this left hemisphere without having any relationship with the, with the other hemisphere. He's written a book called uh, The Master and His Emissary and also a recent book called The Matter with Things. So, to summarize, if there's a single idea that's facilitating the subjugation of nature, and the devastation of the planet. It's the belief that the earth has no consciousness and that we are separate from its life. It therefore doesn't matter what we do to matter. Now we are beginning to awaken to a totally different relationship with the earth and birthing a new story is an evolutionary imperative at this time of unprecedented crisis. A new story that can free us from the false scientific beliefs and the left hemispheric perspective that has increasingly imprisoned us. Without this awakening, we have no future as a species. Imagine the planet with a ring of light around it, composed of all the people who are working now to bring this new paradigm into being. See it as a vision, really, as a friend of mine has seen it, a great ring of light around the planet, protecting it, helping it to survive. Now, I've described to you at some length the pathology of the solar phase of separation presided over by the patriarchal order that had no connection with the feminine. We've had a religion story and we've had a science story, but neither of them have given us a complete picture of our origins, where we come from, our nature, and our role on this planet. At this time of supreme crisis, something is beginning to shift in our species. And the soul of humanity is stirring to life from a long trance-like sleep that's gone on for 4,000 years. The feminine archetype is coming back into our consciousness, bringing with it a new revelation symbolized by the woman standing in front of the tree of life, holding a child. As this soul impulse gathers momentum, the marriage of our rational mind with our long silent soul is beginning to change our perception of reality. So how do we recover our sense of being part of something totally sacred? In chapter 10 of my book, The Dream of the Cosmos, I have defined the feminine as a totally different worldview or paradigm of reality. 
a perspective that regards this planet as part of a sacred cosmic order whose precious life we are here to protect and to serve. The feminine requires a radical transformation of our understanding of life and our relationships, relinquishing the millennia long struggle for power between nations and manifesting as a new planetary consciousness which recognizes the interconnection and interdependence of all aspects of life, increase, including ourselves. Like the magma of the Earth's core, the long repressed feminine principle is rising to meet the masculine one in response to a deep soul impulse to balance and marry these archetypal energies within ourselves and within the world in order to create a new kind of civilization one that is not destroyed by rivalry between nations, but is raised to a higher level by cooperation between them in service of the planet. We tread a path which is on the knife edge between birthing this new vision and regression into barbarism, the barbarism that we can see today taking place in Ukraine. Now the highest values that have been associated with the feminine archetype over millennia are wisdom, love, compassion, justice, beauty, and the longing to heal, nurture, protect, and cherish. And these are what I call the values of the heart. Now, great excitement, I feel here, a door is opening at last onto a new story, which astonishingly is coming to us from quantum physics. In the words of physicist Nassim Haramein, a new cosmology is being born, a new vision of our profound relationship with a conscious, intelligent, and interconnected universe. He compares the astounding new scientific discoveries with the unfolding of the petals of a rose, like the one in this picture. The revelation of our profound connection to the deepest ground of life and to each other could have a powerful influence on how we live our lives, how we relate to the planet and how we interact with each other, recognizing that our every act and even our every thought has an effect on the underlying intelligent field. <clears throat> so quantum physics tells us that the whole universe is a unified field a cosmic web of life, which connects all life forms in our universe and on our planet. Every atom of life interacts with every other atom, no matter how great the distance between them. So none of us is truly separate from others or from other species of life on this planet or from the life of the two billion galaxies of the universe. That is really quite something. That is to me a revelation. Now the soul is the cosmic sea of being or subtle field that underlies and connects all aspects of reality. This new quantum cosmology shows us that the material world we live in exists within a stupendous field of consciousness that is the ground state of the universe. Our human consciousness is part of the consciousness which sustains not only our world, but the entire universe. Each one of us carries within us the holographic imprint of the universe within us. No matter what our race, nation, gender, or caste, each one of us is a part of the living, breathing, connecting web of life, which underlies and connects all life forms in the universe and on our planet. Now I have called this web of life, the soul of the cosmos in my book because I prefer the word soul to mind, because it carries a feminine resonance. Scientists, of course, will use the word field, which is a scientific word. For many years now, the existence of this underlying consciousness has been revealed by thousands of near-death experiences that are accessible to anyone interested in reading about them or listening to them on YouTube. There's particularly one by Anita Morjani, where her life was saved from a terminal cancer by her near-death experience. There are also dozens of courses run by the Shift Network that are help, helping people to develop shamanic skills 
communicate with those who've transitioned to life beyond death and learn innumerable methods of healing and awakening to a greater reality. Something called the Bigelow Institute in the US has recently given a half a million dollar prize to a man who wrote the best thesis on our survival beyond the death of the body. You can read it on their website. That is the Bigelow Institute. Now quantum physics tells us that our world of matter is like a visible foam resting on a very deep ocean of light that permeates every cell of our being. We are not only connected with each other through the astonishing reach of the internet, but through the infinitesimal particles of subatomic matter that are non-locally connected with each other throughout the universe. In our essence, we are beings of light, cosmic beings incarnated on this planet for an evolutionary purpose, a cosmic purpose. All life at the deepest level is essentially one, and each of us is an expression of that one, inseparable from it. The realization that we participate in a cosmic consciousness that is a source and ground of our own consciousness is shattering the belief that material reality is all there is that we exist in a randomly created universe, that our consciousness ends with the death of our physical body and there is no life beyond death. These discoveries challenge the assumption that we humans are the only conscious beings in the universe and that we're separate from it and from the life of all species on this planet and that the universe is without life, intelligence, purpose or meaning. In the nick of time, we are moving from the story of a dead, insentient cosmos to a cosmos that is vibrantly alive and the ground of all that we call life. The new story gives us a new and different image of God or spirit. The old image of God as a distant creator in a place called heaven is undergoing an alchemical transformation. God or spirit or divine mind may be the invisible ground of the entire manifest universe and the ground of our own consciousness. Divine mind or divine soul may therefore not be something separate or distant from us. We may be within it, coexisting and co-creating with it. This to me is one of the great revelations of our time. If God or spirit is the intelligence and the creative energy of the life process itself, pulsing forth at every instant in every region of this vast universe, then how we treat so-called inanimate matter, planetary life and each other, becomes a matter of how we are treating God. In splitting the atom and creating weapons of mass destruction and in killing others who are our soul brothers and sisters, we are mutilating and desecrating the body of God. Now I want to give you some um, aspects of uh, Nassim Haramein's theory of the unified cosmos or the unified field. He says that beneath the visible universe is an underlying electromagnetic field or matrix, like a fabric woven of energy or a lattice or a web. So there's no such thing as empty space. Space is full and it's seething with energy. And he says that we can't separate consciousness, our consciousness from this field because the field is consciousness imprinting, exchanging and transmitting information every nanosecond. Consciousness orders and organizing the organizes the field and its complex interconnected systems at all levels and the evolution of the universe itself. And we are part of this stupendous organization of energy, part of that stupendous consciousness. In the words of physicist and cosmologist, Dr. Jude Caravan, we don't have consciousness, we are consciousness. We don't have consciousness, we are consciousness. 
So Nassim says that we can't really separate so-called inanimate matter, animate self-organizing systems like plants and animals and self-aware organisms like ourselves. All may come to be seen as integrated components of a continuous evolutionary path of information or consciousness growing and unfolding through what we call time. And he says that from the electric magnetic field of a single atom to that of each cell in our body, the entirety of space time is full of fields. And this includes the heart's electromagnetic field and the fields of the earth and the sun and the 200 billion galaxies. The whole of what we call space is full of electromagnetic fields of different magnitudes, all interacting with each other. Even the atom is a field and the proton and electron within it are also fields. And this diagram from the Heart Math Institute shows the extent of the electromagnetic field of the heart, which is connected to the electromagnetic field of the earth when we are connected to our heart. And they give methods for us, teaching us how to connect with our heart, particularly when we're in a state of, of distress or depression. Um, it's in my book, by the way, in one of the chapters, that method of reconnecting with our heart. Now he says that there are 100 trillion cells in our body and 100 trillion atoms in every one of these 100 trillion cells. And each one of these atoms contains a proton and each proton holds trillions of Planck units. Everything is connected through these Planck units, which are named after Max Planck. The size of a Planck unit is like a grain of sand compared to the size of the whole universe. Untold numbers of these electromagnetic oscillators constitute the ground of the material universe. So all so-called matter is made out of protons and these infinitesimal Planck units. These basic particles in the field are oscillating and vibrating so rapidly that there is no apparent space between them. And this electromagnetic oscillation is the ground state of the universe and the ground state of our own material reality. This continuous oscillation is so rapid that it makes matter appear to us as a steady state. And he says that all these infinitesimal <clears throat> Planck units, protons, atoms, and cells are connected to each other and to every observer in the universe, forming a stupendous field of energy in a continuous state of oscillation. And they produce a holographic structure and an incredible dynamic wormhole-like network which connects all points across scales generating a connected living universe. I did a course with him about six years ago in which I learned all this and put it together in a talk I gave at Dartington some five years ago. But it was an astonishing course. I would recommend it to anyone who would like to take it. It's still going, the Resonance Academy. So I want to connect this with the figure of Christ who together with the Buddha uh, experienced the awakening state of cosmic consciousness when he became aware of what I've just explained to you, that everything is connected. I think quantum physics is revealing to us what Jesus was teaching 2000 years ago, that we're all connected and that we are all daughters and sons of God. He told people not to kill because to take the life of another is breaking the law of life. He said, we cannot serve two masters, God and Caesar. My mother's channeled messages said that only when men learn not to shed their brother's blood in war, can the house of God be built upon its true foundations. I'm going to repeat that. Only when men learn not to shed their brother's blood in war, can the house of God be built upon its true foundations. 
until this time, Caesar, that is the will to power that we can see magnified in Putin, as well as in China and the governments and giant corporations of the West, will unju unjustly usurp the power that is God's. We need God's power and light to change our ways of behaving and to recognize where we are condoning evil when we blindly follow our leaders, who are all of them unconscious. There has never been a more terrible time of persecution, war and destruction than during the last 2000 years of Christianity. Christ did not usher in a new era through his sacrifice. We are still stuck in the old patterns because we have not begun to understand his message. His message was not about belief. It was following his teaching in order to become like him. So coming near the end now, I would say that divine spirit is the core of our being and the soul, our soul, is the intermediary between spirit and body. And the body is the temple of the soul and the essential means of our being able to incarnate on this planet. At the same time, it offers us access to the many dimensions of the inner, inner universe and the experience of the divine spirit within us once we begin to become conscious of how it works within us. The more we develop the capacity for love and reverence for life, the more we are in touch with this divine spirit. And I would add that the new story is about relinquishing the fear of death, knowing that all of us survive death and that we are, in our essence, immortal beings. We go on to other dimensions of the universe, but we don't die in our soul. It's only the body that dies. And in my view, we return thousands of times to this planet. Uh, many of us can remember some of our lives. Now, the new story tells us that cosmic light and love are the foundation of our being, the foundation of our consciousness, our intelligence, and our capacity for love. And I thought here I would read you these words that Einstein wrote to his daughter. There is an extremely powerful force that so far science has not found a formal explanation for. It is a force that includes and governs all others and is even behind any phenomenon operating in the universe and has not yet been identified by us. This universal force is love. Love is light that enlightens those who give and receive it. Love is gravity because it makes some people feel attracted to others. Love is power because it multiplies the best we have and allows humanity not to be extinguished in their blind selfishness. Love unfolds and reveals. Love is God and God is love. So imagine this revelation being born in your heart like the unfolding petals of a rose. The forgotten vision of the lunar era is returning to us at a higher turn of the spiral of evolution. We need to connect with who we truly are and hold the highest possible vision of what we want for life on this planet. Imagine that we could see through the physical forms of this world to the subtle patterns of energy interacting with each other and connecting us with the worlds beyond our physical sight. Imagine shining filaments of light flowing through the starry galaxies of space, as well as through our body and the plants and trees and animals and all forms of life that exist around us. If the whole universe is one integrated living organism, one symphony of cosmic sound, then we are part of that whole. And like the rose, we participate as co-creators in the unfolding of our life in this miraculous evolutionary process. At the heart of the cosmos is a love of unimaginable dimensions, a love that sustains the entire universe 
and is the origin of our own capacity to love and to create. To know this is to enable us to heal the pathology of the past and reconnect with the earth and the cosmos. To know this is the secret longing of the life that lives us. Thank you very much.